Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to my lecture. It's a really great honor for me to be here at the GFA convention in New York. And I hope that you will enjoy this presentation that I prepared for you today. Uh, just before we start, if anyone is interested in a PDF copy of this presentation, I'll be very happy to share it with you, so stick around after the lecture. So, first a dramatic transition. Okay. Is it? Hopefully. It's a very interesting topic, but it's riddled with dichotomies, and that's why it's probably one of the reasons why it's so difficult to discuss. Because the process of preparing for a concert performance is deeply personal, and very private, and yet its end result is something very public, a public performance, right? There are also a lot of questions regarding what falls under the realm of practical versus theoretical or even impractical depending on your point of view. So, if we kind of delve too deeply in all the minutiae of our work, like, do we run the risk of losing the bigger picture, you know, what's really important? So, in order to maintain clarity, today's lecture will focus on three key elements. So, solo performances, since they are quite different from other types of uh, concert work, when you are literally all alone on the stage, it can be quite daunting. Uh, then some backstage work. What really goes into creating a performance? Is it obligatory or optional? And also some ideas that you might incorporate into your everyday work. This lecture is definitely not intended as like a list of rules and regulations regarding practice techniques and strategies, but just like a relatively simple, practical guide on how to prepare for a concert performance. So the question is, where do we even begin, right? Um, and this is something that's quite convenient. Uh, unfortunately, not exactly how life works. You know, we go from point A to B and then we reach the finish line. Well, maybe, yeah, it, it, we take that as an example, but if we take it at a face value, right? The only example in what we do, where we can go from point A to B, is literally from the very beginning of just starting to learn a new instrument to the very first performance, and that's it. After that, we immediately lose that linearity. So instead of that, I think it's important to focus on some practical questions, right? So, what am I playing? Am I in the position of choosing my own repertoire, right? Or if not, uh, why? You know, why is it obligatory? Uh, where am I performing? Um, are we sometimes in a position to choose our own venue, you know, and how that might affect the choice of repertoire? And also, who is my audience? Um, also, literally, who is listening? I know that this can be a source of great anguish for a lot of people, a lot of distress. Uh, a lot of people have actually quit playing altogether because they just couldn't handle the pressure of live performance and audience feedback, right? So is, is there a case to be made for like invitation-only events? I mean, we'll discuss that a bit later in the lecture. Uh, regardless of uh, what are we gonna do, the most important question is how do I get there? There? being the concert performance, right? So it all starts in the practice room. And I would definitely encourage you to just make a simple list of things that you believe are required to have a, like a really good practice session, right? So here is my kind of tentative list. Fun animation? Uh, some of them might seem silly, you know, but we use them. Also, these are in this format now, so it's important to do that. Kind of deliberately disconnect from the world, even if it's just for an hour, you know, can be really useful. Um, occasionally, not all the time, because I'm not completely crazy, uh, from my perspective, to have a really good 
practice session, except things that require to sustain life itself, I don't need any of these things. So this is something to kind of keep in mind. Another good question is, literally, what are we working on when we are practicing? So I think it can be kind of boiled down to this, these three things. So repertoire, technique, and some other more or less music <coughs> related skills. So this is that, this is this, and this is what I consider these other skills. It's a very simple slide. It was agonizing to make, not uh, in terms of visual identity, because it's really simple, but um, when you really think about it, what goes on into creating a performance, and all the work that we do as performing artists, you know, it's not just about practicing skills for three hours a day, there's just so much work that goes into it. Uh, I will discuss all of these in the following slides separately. So, a really practical question in the beginning is, um, what do I even want to play, you know? Uh, and another great question is, what is manageable? What does that mean? Uh, from my perspective, it would mean literally manageable, that you can manage them with your models. Uh, not necessarily to stay in your comfort zone, doesn't mean that, but again, you can literally play them at some point, because if you don't really, you have a feeling you can actually play them, that's going to create so many problems immediately, and we haven't even begun practicing. So this is kind of roughly how we can divide it. New material, work in progress, and concert ready. I often ask my students, what do you think concert ready means? I also don't know. I mean, really, this is, I'm being honest here, uh, I definitely know what's new material, so something I haven't looked at before. I'm very often in a position to premiere pieces, so I have literally nothing to go on. Work in progress is, again, literally everything between at the very beginning and the concert. So is it even possible to do this when we are practicing? Not progress, but kind of have retrograde motion. So it's also really important to work on maintenance as well. So these are kind of three things that I do in my everyday work. I try to incorporate analysis and what it really means theory in practice. So it's actually practically useful really important. And a simple example would be, let's say 90% uh, of a certain piece is concert ready, but the 10% is, at least for you, unplayable. That means it's nothing. You know, are you going to edit it completely so it kind of fits your preferences? I don't think so. So that's why it's really important as a first step to really kind of do the work and see what is happening, right? To plan ahead and to be really strategic and deliberate with what you do in your practice sessions. It can be really useful. I know that life it doesn't always treat us kind. Things don't always go uh, as planned, but at least we can kind of make an effort to, to plan ahead. And also this is what I do quite frequently, uh, randomize, again, literally. I try to start from a different point in a piece every single time I play it in a different practice session. This is definitely easier said than done, so this is my visualization of that. These are not strings, but lines in a score, and these are my kind of checkpoints where I started. So it can be a crazy place, you know, uh, completely logical, like a middle of a line, like a beautiful melody. The point here is not really to enjoy the melody. We are practicing. It's very difficult to enjoy what you're playing when you don't know what the, you're playing to begin with. So, it can be a bit of a problem. Also, um, to work on skills that are required to actually physically play what we want to do. <coughs> so, as a part of our daily routine, definitely warm up and skill development. A lot of other people have said uh, so much about technique, I really don't feel like I have anything to add to this conversation except this, and this might be kind of interesting. 
So, from my perspective, in order for these exercises to be really effective, I believe they should fulfill uh, at least one, if not all three, of the following criteria. So I think they should be simple, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily easy, but they're focused. So there's a very clear idea behind them, right? Also repetitive, not boring, hopefully, but you can actually pick up a pattern. You know, that's why I created this loop sign. And also personalized. Doesn't mean it's a tool that you are using, again, to go from point A to B, but that they are meaningful. You know, what does a meaningful scale mean? What, what are you talking about? Well, not only uh, technical exercises individually, but as a set. They should mean something to you personally, right? On the second point, picking up a pattern really important. We are, we are going to remember something from this lecture. Repetition is the compositional element. Variation is a step below it, right? Because it refers back to repetition. Repetition doesn't refer back to anything other than itself, right? So, since it is the element, in terms of composition, it's really important to keep it in mind. And these other skills, sure, some people might find them kind of redundant even. Optional work, right? Why do I need it? Uh, these are some things that we do in school, and then when we graduate, we kind of gradually forget about them, even have this sense of relief. Wow, I finally don't have to deal with these things anymore. So also not really how life works. So here is um, my experience. Uh, I went to a really um, difficult high school, for example, uh, and had a very, very hardcore music theory program. When I was in my, I think they call it junior year, right? Um, 16. Uh, I had almost no guitar lessons, but at least 20 plus hours of classes and homework weekly of music theory. And we really gone through, not literally, but practically everything. It was really intense. And it almost made me not like music anymore, but uh, it wasn't powerful enough. Music was still incredibly important. So I really had to figure out a way in which to utilize that knowledge, uh, kind of disregard all the bad things that are connected with it, or all the diminution and really uh, kind of self-absorbed nitpicking can be really annoying. And that's coming from me, that's really saying something. Uh, and to see what can we really do with it, right? So my solution was to connect it with other forms of artistic expression. Not to make it more fun, because I don't need to be entertained in that way, but again, to make it more <coughs> meaningful. Because black and white with a bunch of letters and numbers meant almost nothing. And at one point, got really in the way of actually preparing something for a performance. Okay, so don't be scared. So this is how I see things when I practice. Um, even though I was at MoMA yesterday, I just wanted to say that I have no pretension to be the next whoever of these 20th century artists. I understand that this is quite simplistic and rudimentary, but this is a kind of a representation of what I see, you know. And I think it will make more <coughs> sense when I do, slightly more sense when I do this, right? Oh, wow. And this has been a really agonizing journey, you know. I'm not saying it was all horrible, because it wasn't, it was very challenging. Uh, because at one point I was really sick of theory. I really couldn't stand it. And I had to find a way to break through that barrier. And this was my solution. Um, to kind of visualize um, all of the elements that I learned and to show 
that scores can also look a bit more exciting and vibrant. You know, even though I think in my class I would I would get definitely an F for this. No, something below that. What's below an F? Like a P or a W. Uh, I would get a nothing. I would get you know pick a finger from my professors uh, because this looks like what is this? And yet it's very meaningful. I have a not so funny anecdote, but I have to show this to one of my composition professors at university, and I was really kind of stupidly excited, thinking that he would like love it immediately. Of course, he hated it, but it was completely ridiculous. Uh, and then years later, I showed it to a different composer, uh, just not expecting anything, and he didn't love it, but he definitely had like a visceral response to it. And he said something that was, I, I really appreciated it because it was his piece. And he said, yeah, it's, like, I don't get it I, why you do this, but it's factually correct. Yes, this is what's happening in this piece, right? <laughs> but that's kind of the point. It's factually correct, so it's rooted in, let's say, the real world. But this has meaning for me. And I'm going to say some things that are quite heavy right now. I was really struggling with... Uh, performance and um, especially memory. My memory is not great, you know, I'm not afraid to admit it, I don't feel like I should be ashamed of it. It's fine, it's okay. And after I started working like this, this hasn't been easy, I can tell you that when I'm performing, I know exactly where I am. So, this is, I know quite a bold statement might even, you know, be a bit pretentious, but I really can actually enjoy the performance. I don't have this fear of just dying mid-performance and having a memory slip and then having to like DNF a performance, which has happened before, it's extremely uncomfortable. Uh, so this has been, if you're going to look at practical sides, incredibly useful. Uh, and I would definitely encourage everyone to uh, kind of explore what you can do to, to perfect this technique. Uh, now back to the real world, an important thing of preparing for a concert is all of this, again, depending on the level of production. So this is weeks, months, years before the performance. A uh, really good kind of thought experiment with this would be to just imagine one or more of these things kind of failing spectacularly, and then you'll see how important they are, or if they really carry no importance at all, right? In any case, again, I think it's a really good thing to just put things down on paper or whatever digital device, and to just make a simple checklist. It's really easy, and it can save a lot of nerves. Really. <laughs> and then, just before, Here I mean the day of, and like an hour before the performance. I have really only three simple things to say in terms of advice. Uh, and they are all kind of impossible for some people, even for me. I mean, I just, there was this point in my life, I just had to do things all the time. No, really try to preserve your energy, because concerts, especially solo performances, are stressful enough. You don't need more problems. Right? Uh, really value your personal space, especially if no one else is going to do that. You have to be really careful because some actual damage can occur as a result of that. And also mentally prepare for the stage. That hour before the performance is critical. I think you should really um, take time to harness that energy because it's really, really powerful. Some of you maybe saw me uh, pacing up and down like a lunatic. This is uh, what I do uh, to kind of get in the zone, uh, especially when I'm all alone, because I know how much effort and energy it takes. At least for me, someone else might be fine. But that's why it's really important to understand what you're doing and to trust your process. Right? And focus and... 
So, this is how I see the performance itself. It's a kind of a triangle thing, and I'm going to speak from my perspective. Right? So, I'm the performer. Uh, I have this tremendous responsibility of communicating someone else's ideas to a, let's say, more or less appreciative audience. So this is already incredibly stressful, but you have to accept it. So in this position, I'm kind of also taking the role of the composer. I can say, again, from my perspective, I've done everything that was possible to uh, transmit those ideas as faithfully as possible. Also this, what does the role of a conductor mean when there's literally only one person on the stage? In my performances, I sometimes go a bit overboard and very physical, which is hilarious because I'm like a 200 pound weirdo with a shiny blazer. But I try to move around, uh, not because I need that physical fitness, because, I mean, look at me, but um, I, I kind of have this just almost like natural urge to express physically in that way as well. The role of the conductor is to design the entire performance. So if you don't have that, who is doing it, right? And as a result, do you have any idea that what you're doing? It's very dangerous territory. I don't like to be on that kind of thin ice, mostly because of my weight I will literally fall through. Uh, and also I try to focus on my favorite thing, and that's the audience, but from two different perspectives. So, I'm the audience as well. What I try to do in my performances is to, again, prepare. I had months, years appreciate it, but then when you're on the stage, focus and try to enjoy the performance yourself first, because that's all that you can do. And then, hopefully, you can make it an enjoyable experience for everyone else. There's no guarantee. I mean, you can throw yourself around all the time. You can throw all kind of gimmicky shit. It won't work if you also don't want to listen to that performance. So that's number one thing for me. If I want to selfish, not the point here. If I cannot enjoy it, then it's going to make it a really miserable experience for everyone else. We don't need that. Life is horrible enough. So, Another great question is, when does the performance end, right? I think for a lot of people, um, kind of the aftermath of the performance is just when it begins. That's when you really need to sell it, right? I don't particularly share that with the viewpoint. I think it's kind of over when you step off the stage, right? That's it. Also, a really interesting lesson is to look at performances as uh, stylized life. So when I'm on the stage performing, I really don't feel like I'm a part of the rest of the world. I'm someplace else, you know. I don't know when or where, but when I step off the stage, definitely in the real world, right? So I'm trying to maintain focus because a lot of mess can happen after a performance because you're completely trained, you're uh, energy is very low, I'm thinking, at least in my case, and a lot of additional bad things can happen. So maintain focus and also deal with feedback and criticism. As performers, especially solo performers, in my case, freelance concert artists, which is hardly a thing, so I mean, <laughs> let's really just say things out loud, right? But like, what was that? How do you live? I don't. But the thing is, you have to deal with it. Right? And what we can only hope for as performers that the feedback would be positive and the criticism will be constructive, right? Fun animation. Something that's slightly less fun. We have to deal with people, which is not my favorite thing. Uh, someone might be like in a particularly like bellicose mood after a performance and just wants to fight, you know? And not, not my favorite crowd. On the other hand, Someone might be like overly like adulatory about your performance. Everything was great and perfect, right? Um, if this behavior persists, it can only create more difficulties. In the first case, it's a sign of, well, basically, just 
almost personal antagonism. And the second is with that kind of saccharine style where everything is perfect and amazing. You, it, it might reflect like lack of original thought. The thing is, when you have to work on something, and when it really work and get your hands dirty, which is what we literally do, I don't think it's the most appropriate way to go. It's really easy to go on either end of these extremes, but it's very difficult to meet somewhere in the middle. And that's where all the work happens. So please, when you're evaluating your work, be specific. There's no place for vagueness here because you're not really helping anyone. <coughs> and in the end, if no one cares, which can be the case sometimes, I've experienced that before, value your performance. It's a really hard lesson for me, but uh, I'm trying. And by extension, of course, value life itself. So, for the closing couple of sections, this is the idea segment. If we are going to remember anything from this lecture, it would be this line. Because this has completely changed the way I prepare for concepts. So mental practice, when it all boils down to, means, again, literally, just practicing without your instrument. That's why I said, if I'm going to have occasional a really great practice session. I don't need anything, including this, nothing, just me, and that's it. It can be quite scary. Um, I would suggest to start anywhere, read anything, just without the instrument. A lot of your questions will be answered immediately, right? I don't know what I'm doing, this is confusing, this is a piano piece, why is this a piano? A lot of questions. Don't worry about it, just keep going. This is again, linear. Going. This is an essential part of my concert preparation. Another set of heavy words, I would not go out on the stage without this. And this is coming from someone who I just, again, I know it sounds crazy, I just know that I'm going to play. There's no doubt in my, not the creepy band, no doubt in my mind that it's going to be fine, at least in that respect. And why? Stylized life, and also it's part of my preparation process. It's something that's within my control, right? If a brick falls, I don't know which one, uh, now, mid-performance, or I suffer a stroke, that's not something I can control, right? It just happened. But this, I can't do something about it, right? Again, uh, when you're visualizing things, be specific. Vagueness is really not your friend here. And for some advanced practice techniques, which is again, um, quite useful because it also works on different levels. Uh, yeah, this is a bit controversial. I, I will explain. Okay. So first playthrough is the premiere performance. Okay, bear with me. So, I uh, have been doing this for quite some time. And but once you start doing this, there's really no going back because all of the other techniques are kind of uh, silly. I mean, they really seem ridiculous in comparison because this is the best exercise for focus and discipline. Um, not two like, super fun things, at least for me. My mind tends to be quite scattered and um, I also have a lot of difficulties with that, I'm willing to accept it. Um, but it's really worthwhile, in my opinion. So, I came here without my guitar. I was so, so happy. I mean, traveling without the guitar, it was a, like, a gift. I really appreciate it. It was great, you know, like, oh, you go, girl. Uh, but, so, I really appreciate it, but here's the thing. I have a concert on Sunday. Uh, I don't have my guitar, I'm not going to practice. So, how am I going to play it? I, it's going to be fine, you know. Also, I'm playing a piece which I haven't uh, physically touched uh, yet. <coughs> uh, I've been working on it since, I think, like, the end of April. So, kind of 50 plus days. haven't touched it like this. Uh, not the most difficult piece, definitely not the easiest piece in the guitar, but that's why it's new, interesting, hopefully we'll 
uh, hear it and about it in the following years. Um, I know it seems a bit strange, but I, I just know it's going to be great, you know. I've done this before, it's a bit extreme, um, but from my perspective, I really wouldn't go back because the standard thing is kind of dredging and kind of going over things over again. And not the best approach, at least not for me. I've been playing for, you know, almost 30 years at this point. You get a bit fatigued at some point. And also with these things, um, one of um, obvious advantages is also that you really cut down the risk of injuries. Um, and if you are willing to kind of be really deliberate and strategic with these type of uh, practice sessions, I think it's really worthwhile. But a great question would be, um, <coughs> how do you kind of even design an experiment which would uh, test that hypothesis? <coughs> Not so sure. So the most important question that I think researchers, and artists of course, but they have been asking that question for a while. Researchers, I'm not so sure, what are we working towards, right? So again, my perspective. There are two glaringly obvious problems. So number one is technology, but not for too long. You know, it's kind of, simple, rudimentary at this point, it's not going to stay that way for too long, right? And when you're able to track everything, and I mean really everything, I can't even say it out loud, it's horrifying, then this question becomes a bit more poignant. Um, and this is one of the main tenets of research, and you're going directly against it. So this is really a question, what are you doing? You know, seriously. I have a solution to this, you know, be besides cancer and world peace. I also have a solution for this as well. Uh, but it's kind of impossible because it's this uh, and also this. And they're not super fun. Uh, so what I mean by this is that we really need to kind of change the way we think. And it's really brutal. It's <laughs> uh, quite something else. Uh, and there needs to be a paradigm shift on both sides, right? So mm -hmm. artists really shouldn't look at researchers as just some, you know, lab codes and are just doing some things that are completely useless, they're their own purpose, who cares, on one hand. And on the other, researchers to view artists or whoever as just, you know, test subjects, um, guinea pigs, you know, slightly large guinea pigs, that you just use, kind of, and discard when you don't need them anymore. I don't think that that leads to anything else other than the dead end, with emphasis on dead, then also end. Uh, and that's, that's a problem, you know, a really big one. And the next question, and the final one, is there really a future of a poor concert music? This is kind of my Easter egg. I've been calling classical music, concert music for a while now. I don't know if someone else is doing it as well. That's wrong. Classical music, that's like objectively, no. It's concert music and also concert guitar. I know it's a bit of a hot take, it's a bit controversial, but I'm gonna advocate that. It's really important because it emphasizes the importance of a live performance, not so much in, in some of the other areas of music. This is something that we have, uh, we can look forward to. A new repertoire written by these people, and also these people, and these people. Uh, if, are, if I'm going to be like really positive and going to hug a rainbow and be a delicate dandelion, I'm going to say that this is brilliant and amazing, and it really is. Although some of the sinister implications are really horrifying. So we. <laughs> really have to be careful with where this kind of technology is going. I think, I kind of conveniently disregard some of the bad things, um, can be really exciting. You know, we can expect to see brand new repertoire, you know, 
a piece by Beethoven where someone will die. This is absolutely happening, and it seems completely crazy. It will require a change of format in terms of concert music, concert performances. Might be an abstract concept at this point, but I said <coughs> likely to become practical. And as we remember, this is a practical guide, right? This kind of randomly generated AI music, sure, again, rudimentary, simple, a bit silly, or now, you know. Uh, if we implement this collaboration approach, this music is going to be legit great, of course. It lacks this kind of time, historical value element, but it's going to be really good, high quality music. How do you play a concert? you know, 60 minutes recital of something that was composed by a thing, you know, borderline life. <laughs> this is going to be a requirement. It uh, has to affect the education uh, and how we educate the following generations of what's really important in music. What are we doing in the first place, right? And then I would go back to that infamous triangle from the performance slide um, of this presentation. Uh, there is so much to be done, there's so much work. I absolutely don't believe that the music is dead, that contemporary, contemporary music, and I have a degree in contemporary music, is killing everything it isn't. Uh, people are killing everything, but <laughs> what else is new? There is so much that can be done. But like I said, the most important thing is collaboration. And I think that there is really a lot that we can achieve together in this area. And I think that's it for me. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoyed my presentation. Does anyone recognize this background? Because that's great if they don't. Okay. Copyright infringement. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if anyone has any questions, I'll be very happy to try to answer them. And also if someone is interested in a copy of this lecture, I'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah, yeah. I kind of cannot speak yeah. <coughs> So you mentioned that you're, you do a lot of the mental practice coursing. I do. Did I, did I understand correctly that you're not really practicing the piece physically on the guitar? Did you just the look at the, the that I'm playing on Sunday? Score, visualizing and then you're performing? Well, okay, yeah, I can say that. The piece that I'm playing on Sunday, it's a bit extreme. I haven't touched it physically. I haven't played a single note of it. Uh, uh, some of the other things that I do are not as extreme. I think I can do that because I've been doing this for, I think, like 15 years at this yeah. point. Um, but this is what I do every time when I'm starting to learn a new piece. I don't touch the guitar, the guitar is someplace else. I sometimes forget it's there. Uh, but I'm very well aware of the score. And then I start to immediately sketch things out with that uh, kind of coloristic slide. And again, try to be as specific as possible. If I encounter an insurmountable obstacle, I won't play it. But <laughs> that's a privilege that you have when you are kind of a whatever I am at this point. Freelance yeah, concert. I can see that artist. working for certain <laughs> pieces. Yeah. So what the hell is that? I can see that working for certain pieces, but for, you know, you, it's, it depends on, it would depend on the repertoire and stuff. You mean first touch for first performance thing? Yeah. That doesn't work for it, of course. Yeah. yeah. It, but that's extreme. That's an extreme example. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, this kind of approach, as a starting point, works for everything. Yeah, I mean, there's, really two, there's two schools, right? But I, I think, I think you, you, make, you make a very valid point that it's super important to do the visualization and to, to work you know, away from the instrument, that absolutely. If you think I'm a mess now, <laughs> I was a complete mess 15 plus years ago yeah. when it came yeah. to perform. I, can I did not <laughs> want to play. Yeah. I really enjoyed music, I loved performing, but there was just something that was really holding me back. And plus this, I had no fucking idea what I was doing. 
Here's the thing, I'm not a composer, a composer, and I've worked with composers, they might say, what you're doing is ridiculous. And I'm telling you, yes, you literally wrote the piece, but you're not performing it. So shut up, and let me do my thing. I, they're my colleagues. Some of them are still, some are still talking to me, some are not. Uh, but this is my approach, I, I appreciate you, I think that you're a brilliant composer, but let me do my work, right? That perspective changes really important. You know, there are a lot of uh, composers that will never play their piece, and that's a fact. Someone else will, right? I, I find it quite admirable what you did with your, because I, when you're talking about the theory teacher and the, the courses... It stuff, was very abusive. You know, I come from that kind of Soviet background. Yeah, well, I have to tell you, I went through a similar program in Canada, and it's... It, My it, 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 I know, exactly, and it practically turned me off music totally. It, it was but very it, but Catholic school. It didn't work, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I was able to, uh, like you, uh, you know. But they didn't destroy it. Yeah. So you, you were able to twist that positively. That's, that's amazing. It's, it's great. It was horrible. Yeah. But I am a survivor. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares, right? Uh, I do. <laughs> so, so this is important. Mm -hmm. I also went to uh, two completely different high schools. So in the morning, I went to like a regular normal people's school where I had, I think, 16 or 17 different subjects. <laughs> and then it was a Catholic music school in the afternoon. Uh, so it was really intense. I had so much homework, especially in math and physics and logic, uh, which seems crazy, but I learned the most from these subjects. I went not to give up easily. You know, when you encounter a, a mm -hmm. seemingly insurmountable obstacle or problem, to but really work on finding a creative solution because it is there, yeah. you know. And yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> I cannot believe it, but I am. Uh, any other questions? Really? If, just like, could I add just one thing to the post-concert performance? As I see this, we have some time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, that you didn't mention, but I've seen performers sort of argue with audience people, say, oh, I love your performance. They say, well, actually, it wasn't that good. And it's, it's just a really bad idea. You mean that fake modesty? Right. That fake modesty, which is sometimes encountered uh, I, in... I don't know if it's fake, but it's just... Really? It's too <laughs> much. <laughs> yeah. Call it speed, it's speed. <laughs> oh, I was so bad. Oh, my gosh, I should be punched. <laughs> Please. That's why I might seem like a, a bit of an abrasive personality, right? I might like fit in brilliantly in New York. I don't know why I avoided coming here. Um, no, no, it's not. I, I, I don't care for it. Well, of course, yeah, I'm saying it's a terrible idea. Oh, they're on the same page, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love it. It's ridiculous. If people think that my approach is ridiculous, which I can see that, and I, I am willing to accept it, then this is, especially, like I said, when you actually have to do actual work uh, inappropriate, almost uh, disrespectful on a personal level, right? Oh, no, it's shut up. Well, and not you, but... Musicians do that in, like, a country music. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, could be, because you got guys out there drinking, whatever, and you're always going to get the guys... If you can believe that, I don't drink. If you stay, if you stay too late, you're going to get some guy who says, well, you're not so bad. But you kick my ass, you know? <laughs> okay. You know, and so country players like Willie Nelson, he... I've How is quickly. he still alive, by the way? <laughs> yeah, and he said he, he learned real quick. As soon as the concert's over, get the heck out of there. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I don't have to worry about that because no one shows up usually. <laughs> so I have plenty of time and space to be my favorite thing, and that's to be alone with myself. So great. Uh, but yeah. I can, I can see that, how they just want to leave. Or is that like this, you just pop off after that. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, that's the only way to do it. Just, just get out of there. <laughs> it's not worth it. No. Yeah, that was a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If that's it, if you don't have any questions.